we are really excited and uh, happy and uh, pumped up that you all are here um, for our conference today um, on Mind the Housing Gap, uh, Addressing the Missing Middle of Housing uh, in Walkable Communities. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to make a brief introduction on a few things. Um, the Congress for New Urbanism, for those who aren't familiar with us, we're a uh, national organization dedicated to built environment, um, studying it and applying uh, the knowledge to build um, sustainable, um, walkable, uh, connected urban communities. Um, today here, um, we are the uh, Illinois State Chapter of the Congress, which is a national organization. Um, and as a state chapter, we are a, a multi multidisciplinary organization. We're made up of planners, architects, um, advocates in housing, transportation, the environment, and other fields, uh, developers, landscape architects, and a whole host of other professions that I'm missing, um, all dedicated towards holistic solutions to the, the urban environment. Um, we're really excited to have everybody here today to talk about um, two intertwined issues that I think are really near and dear to our heart as um, new urbanists. One of those two issues is urbanism in general. Um, when the Congress was convened um, several decades ago, our urban assets were really um, in disinvestment and undervalued. Um, and and so we've come together over the years as advocates to do many things, to expand um, housing choice beyond a single family home in both suburban and urban communities, uh, to build walkable neighborhoods and sustainable neighborhoods near amenities, um, and to provide transportation choice beyond the um, automobile to transit, walking, biking, uh, and multiple modes. Um, but there's a second intertwined issue that's become uh, increasingly important with urbanism and that we're, we see is becoming more critical to address every day, and that's affordability. Um, when, the, when CNE first convened around these issues, there was no real proof of concept for uh, urbanism in the market, and that's changing um, uh, very quickly. Now, I worked in transit-oriented development, for example, for eight years, and over that eight, those eight years, um, that development type has gone from an aspiration among planners to something that the market is delivering at a very high price. Um, and in neighborhoods where I've worked, is increasingly seen as um, uh, an agent of uh, gentrification and displacement. And in other neighborhoods, um, in our suburban communities, um, while communities have been successful in adding housing in a walkable context, it hasn't necessarily been tailored to um, every market need, um, either generationally with um, rising income inequality and rising uh, uh, student loan debt, or in terms of unit size or any number of factors. And so we really honed in on this topic because I think we all really want to make this work better. Um, and to make it work better, um, there's really a missing middle that we have yet to address in community building. And that's everything between the single family home and the multifamily building. As we'll talk about later, it's a really big part of our regional housing stuff. Um, and yet it's not something we talk about a lot or put together um, uh, policy interventions to address. Um, and so we, you know, we really think that we could be doing so much more to elevate uh, the role of small buildings in our communities and facilitate better conversation and policy around that. Um, so that's what brings us here today. Uh, we have a really exciting program for you today. Um, we're really excited to be here in Oak Park. Um, and we want to thank both um, the Oak Park Library and the uh, Oak Park Regional Housing Center for their, um, uh, and the Village of Oak Park for their support um, and collaboration on the event. We want to think of our event today less as a presentation to you um, as to what we and our panelists think um, could be done around small building types in the missing middle of housing, and more of a learning lab to address what we've been thinking so far and build a community to um, document and, and incubate solutions around it. And with that in mind, we've got a few things on the program today. Um, we will. Uh, um, discuss trends and policies and small building types in the morning. Um, 
We're going on a documentation tour right before lunch um, to uh, document building types uh, in the village of Oak Park. In the afternoon, we'll have a debate um, between the developer, municipal, and uh, architectural perspective on this topic. And then we've got an exciting focaccia shop on um, really important and exciting implementation activities that are going on around the region. Um, I think this is really a, uh, an excellent first step to um, building a community around this critical topic. So before we get started with the program, I think it's really important to thank a bunch of different folks um, who have made this event possible. And um, I'd like to start with our sponsors. We're really honored at the uh, generosity of um, numerous sponsors in making this conversation a reality. So I'd like to start by introducing two of our network level sponsors. Um, first, I'd like to start with uh, Elizabeth McNicholas of uh, MGLM. Thank you very much, um, and I'll try not to jabber your ears off, but they gave me a mic for, they said five minutes, I won't take that long. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you very much to CNU and I and all the board members for the opportunity to uh, participate and contribute to today's conference. Um, this is the very first time I've ever pitched my company without any visuals, so we'll see how it lands. Okay. Uh, the question I want to pose to everyone today is, when you go on vacation, do you like to travel to places such as Paris? Um, or if you're like me and have young children and an aversion to eight-hour flights, do you choose places like Charleston and New Orleans? Um, if you do, do you notice any other tourists there along with you? There are probably thousands, if not tens of thousands, on any given day in these cities, right? And that's called social, social proof. Um, while many of the people in this room may tell ourselves that we travel to these places to study the good urbanism, um, that's a bit of a canard. We go on our vacations in order to based in beauty because beauty is restorative. Um, and this is the same for everyone who isn't us, designerly minded, all of our clients and the other great unwashed masses. Um, we like being in Paris and Charleston and New Orleans because they are beautiful places. We all go on vacation for restoration, and we tend to choose vacation locations that will surround us with beauty, be it man-made or natural. Mother Nature's got sort of the natural realm wrapped up. Um, <laughs> we make this choice because beauty is restorative. Um, this is a universal for all humans. So, um, the problem is that we actually spend about 95% of our year, therefore 95% of our adult lives, in our own homes, our own neighborhoods, and our own um, towns. So um, this is the same for all the people that we are creating places for together. Uh, and they are probably just as stressed out with life as we are. So let's aim for beauty everywhere. Um, because again, beauty is restorative. Uh, beautifully, beautiful, geographically distinct character, character field architecture makes all the difference in the quality of a place and it's in the best interest of anyone who considers themselves a placemaker to enlist the help of designers who understand these concepts and possess the capability to create beauty. So MGLM Architects, we're at your service. Um, we're also a women-owned business. Um, and if you don't factor beauty into the design of the places you're, that you are making, we are also available to the um, disgruntled citizens groups who want to present a counterproposal to their <laughs> local government bodies. <laughs> we have a broad menu of offerings. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to participate. Cheers. I'd also like to introduce another one of our network level uh, sponsors, Far Associates, and um, Tim Kirby is here to um, uh, kick off as well. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, on behalf of Far Associates, I want to thank CNU Illinois for inviting Jim Cooman to present the work of the Incremental Development Alliance. Jim's a friend of the firm and we're excited about his involvement. And uh, we've been uh, incorporating missing metal into our work for several years, and we're hungry to grow into becoming incremental developers as well. Any folks who are interested in, uh, in talking to us about any collaborations anywhere in the region, uh, we would love to hear from you. We also have a new book coming out at the end of the year. It's, uh, it, 
December or January, um, called Sustainable Nation, Urban Design Patterns for the World We Want. And there's some postcards at the front desk. If, if you'd like to grab one on the way out, that'd be wonderful to spread the word. Uh, John Anderson, one of the leaders of this movement, is a contributor to the book. Uh, so uh, do put it on your holiday list. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, hosts and collaborators in Oak Park, um, including the Oak Park Regional Housing Center and Rock Remire. Um, the village of Oak Park, I'm not sure if uh, Tammy Grossman is here at, at the moment, but uh, Tammy, um, thank you for your support as well. And the, uh, of course, the Oak Park Library for providing us the space um, for this wonderful event. Thank you very much for, um, for your collaboration. Um, we have a number of speakers that we'll introduce later, um, but if our speakers could just stand up for a sec, including our Pikachu Cha folks. Um, we uh, have a really exciting program here um, from our speakers, and uh, uh, thank you very much. We've got some other folks coming later. And then finally, um, we are a volunteer board, and I am hoping that uh, my other members on the CNU Illinois board can uh, stand up or uh, wave their hand. Um, this was really a collaborative event among all of us. And I want to give particular recognition to um, Jen Settle, who's right in the back, who really envisioned this whole thing. This was her baby. Um, we were there. All right, let's get going. Um, so before, well, as we get started with our day today, um, we thought it'd be useful to just talk through some trends in regional housing and walkable communities that we've been experiencing and um, why we think this is such a critical issue now. Um, my name, again, is Kyle Smith. Um, I'm the planning director of the Antero Group. Um, I've worked extensively in uh, transit-oriented development with the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Um, and I've really seen this issue evolve a lot over the years. Um, so what is the missing middle? Well, it goes by many names in our region. The two flat, the row home, the town home, the coach house, the tiny home. We even have some wonky names for it, like the granny flat and the accessory dwelling unit. But thinking generally, the missing middle is all of the housing types that fill the gap between the single family home and large apartment buildings. Um, there are things we recognize in all of our neighborhoods um, and in much of our historic urban fabric. And today, it's probably more, more critical than ever that we focus on this important housing type. Why? Well, one, there's unmet demand um, nationally and regionally to live in multiple communities. So this slide here is a 2015 um, survey from the National Association of Realtors. Asked four different generations to choose between two different housing types. Home A, on the left, is det the detached, conventional, um, car-oriented single-family home. Home B, on the right, is the attached, walkable unit within walking distance to rest. By the walkable communities that we do have are appreciating very quickly. Um, Redfin did a study of home price home prices in a number of markets across the United States and found that um, as walk score increases from one neighborhood to another, the premium on that sales price goes up. And in the Chicago region, the premium, home price premium for an increase in walk score from 60 to 80 is $78,000. Um, now that's not all. Um, there's an additional premium for every single walk point score above that. Um, another $6,000. Um, and I think you can really see that in our region in communities uh, that have this walkable housing stock. Um, prices are going up really rapidly. At the same time, um, the price of uh, the burden of both housing and transportation is also increasing very rapidly. Um, so this map here is from the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Um, it's a shaded map of the combined burden of housing and transportation um, on income for those who are making 80% uh, of the area median income. Um, and, and for those households who we could call um, uh, working class households, 
The combined cost of just those two things is 60% of income, 60 cents on the dollar um, spent on housing and transportation at a time when places where the transportation cost is low, um, it's getting more and more expensive. And rents are going up really quickly, really, really quickly uh, among multiple income bands. Um, so this is data from the U.S. Census between 2005 and 2015 um, across four different income types. Um, in 2005, we um, are extremely low, very low, and low income households um, had a pretty big housing burden um, in Cook County as a whole. And that has only increased in the last several years. So um, in 2010, it has gone up, um, and just in the last five years, it has gone up again. And I think what is really important to note here is that, house, is that rents are becoming really unaffordable um, for multiple parts of the market. So as planners and architects and advocates, um, we've often looked to our transit nodes as part of the answer to delivering um, this housing. And this real estate cycle, that has happened. But it has not necessarily happened in the way I think a lot of us originally envisioned it. Um, the buildings that have been delivered near transit um, often, not universally, have been really expensive. Um, they've had really small units. Um, and in communities that have been experiencing change or had um, a historic, historically uh, more affordable or a mix of housing types, have been seen as um, um, agents of gentrification rather than um, a solution for providing more housing choice. And frankly, I think they're right. Um, I look at the rents in some of these buildings as an advocate, and I, I'm a little shocked. Um, but I think that it's important to say that we need to take a step back. Big buildings, like transit-oriented developments, with 50 or more units, have never been the key part of our regional housing stock. Small buildings have. Um, this data here is from the American Community Survey. Um, in blue, um, on the left are different price points of housing burden for both owners and renters. Um, in blue is single family homes. In red is the missing middle, or buildings with between 2 and 50 units. And in green is large multifamily buildings with uh, 50 units or more. Um, for Households in our region that pay more than a, a twelve fifty in ownership costs or rent, um, a good chunk of the housing stock is in the single family home. But when you go down to households that are making um, one hundred percent of area median income, which is about sixty thousand dollars a year, forty five percent of the units that are affordable at that level are in the missing middle. That's a huge part of our housing stock in these building types. Um, you go down a little bit lower to $800, which um, is roughly what's affordable to, at 60% very uh, area median income. And it's actually a little bit lower um, than the other band, but it's still a really big, a very large chunk of our affordable housing supply um, are in these buildings. And here's another way to look at it. Um, this is a this is the average gross rent. So now this is just renters of um, different building types in Cook County. Uh, this is from the U.S. Census. Uh, the single family home uh, is a little over $1,200 per month. But then when we get into our missing middle types, rent goes down, stays down, goes back up a little bit. And where is it in the large multifamily, our TODs? It's a lot higher. The fact is that um, the missing middle types have been um, one of the critical ways to deliver and preserve affordable housing in our communities, um, and we really need to focus on them. Yet, as important as it is, it's going missing. So this is a two-flat in the Logan Square community in Chicago. Um, can anybody guess? Uh, what this building sold for as a single family home. 25 million. Hmm? 1.2 million. 1.2 million. And, and this is pretty typical. That's in, in Chicago. That's in Chicago. That's in, um, that's in Logan Square. 
So since 2006, you know, I'd like to map out the direction that our housing supply um, has gone. It's, it's been a pretty interesting period to look at. Um, this will include our, uh, the foreclosure crisis. So our single family home stock um, went up a little bit, um, then went back down, and as the market has uh, um, picked up again, our inventory is um, increasing. But if you look at the missing middle housing types, uh, units between units and buildings between um, build, units and buildings with between two and uh, 50 units, it's gone down, way down. Um, and this is Cook County data, um, but the uh, the aggregate drop in Chicago has been a loss of 15,000 units uh, in this building type, and the rest of Cook County is another 5,000. Um, and our large multifamily types, our TODs, have been increasing. So it's really important that we focus on this now because we're losing it and we're not replacing it. This is a uh, chart of building permits in the Chicago region as a whole. In blue are building permits for uh, single family homes since 2006. In red, two to four flats, um, and in green, multifamily. You can see that single family went down, came back up. You can see the increase in multifamily building that I think we all uh, uh, have observed across the region. But among the small building types, um, permits for those building types have only been 4% uh, of what's been permitted since 2006. Um, such an important building type, and we're not building it. Um, and so I have one more question for you all, and hopefully I can field it with this format. What is the median age of our two to four unit buildings in the Chicago region? 76 years. By contrast, the median age for a single family home and our multi family buildings are about half that. Um, it's critical that we re preserve them and it's critical that we um, begin to build them again. So what can we do about it? Well, that's why we're all here today. Um, and before introducing Jim, I just want to quickly go over eight principles for rebuilding our missing middle. Um, these eight principles come from uh, Octopus Design, which really pioneered um, the missing middle concept. One, um, build and foster a, uh, a walkable context and make it easy for households to um, have transportation choice to get around. Two, focus on a smaller building footprint. Um, we've really focused our housing supply on things that are big, and it's important to focus on things that are small. Three, lower perceived density. Um, there's a lot of ways to incrementally add density in our urban neighborhoods. They're not necessarily big buildings. They can be accessory dwelling units, townhomes, um, any variety of things, and Jim will talk about this a bit better in a second. And four, be smaller and well-designed. Five, and this is near and dear to my heart, lower off-street parking. Um, we dedicate a lot of land to housing cars that we could really dedicate to housing people. Focus on simple construction, um, which is easier to do in a smaller building footprint um, with less need for um, materials, elevators, and uh, any number of things. Be community focused, and I think this is a really important part of our event today. Um, Build communities and rebuild communities that interact with um, uh, the existing community. And eight, um, recognize the market to demographic change. Um, our demand for housing is changing. It's changing a lot um, from the post-war single-family home uh, archetype that uh, uh, has really affected our supply to this point. Acknowledge the market to that change. So with that, um, the last critical question really is how do we implement it? And that's why we're really excited today to have Jim Kuman here from the Incremental Development Alliance. Um, he is the executive director of the Incremental Development Alliance, and I just want to introduce him really quick before calling him on the stage. Uh, he's an urban designer and small developer based in Minneapolis with over 10 years experience in the design, transportation, and real estate industry. His career began working in construction management and architecture companies, learning how to deliver multifamily, mixed-use, and institutional buildings in a number of markets. Um, 
As a co-founder of the Alliance, Jim has cultivated a national team of implementers from a myriad of real estate industries to create training classes for individuals and um, provide tactical coaching guidance to cities and community organizations across the country. Um, born in southeastern Michigan, he is an alumnus of the University of Michigan with a degree in architecture. Um, Jim, we're really honored to have you here, and I turn the stage to you. station uh, to, uh, to the library here. <laughs> uh, I was here about uh, 10 years ago now. Uh, when I was in architecture school in, uh, in Michigan, uh, I was, uh, obviously Chicago was the place that was, was, was the city that actually worked. Uh, growing up in the Detroit region uh, for my, my childhood, uh, having family, my parents grew up in Detroit. Uh, that city was not the city that you could study because it, we were rapidly losing our architectural heritage, losing the, our neighborhoods. Uh, and so it wasn't quite the place you could study, at least for the, the reasons of uh, trying to create new buildings or uh, preserve the old neighborhoods. Uh, that was actually happening here in Chicago 10 years ago. And uh, what a what a market uh, change has happened here in Chicago. Uh, some for the better, some maybe not. Uh, and so what's really interesting though that I see, I was staying just to the west of here, and uh, I always take a drive from the neighborhoods. Uh, obviously, I've never got an expressway here to Chicago if I could help it, uh, know that much. But uh, it was interesting to see uh, what's going on just to the west of here. Uh, because uh, the suburbs, as we might know it, are very different in Chicago than in other places uh, because of the legacy of places like Fourth Park, Oak Park, uh, some of the suburbs both north and south. Um, they function very much like, actually better than most urban places, <laughs> most actual urban core places in the country. Uh, you know, places that are far from you know the neighborhoods that everyone knows about Chicago. Um, these uh, walkable streets, the connected grids, uh, the commercial corridor that's close to the housing, uh, all those pieces of the puzzle are still happening here in what otherwise we consider the first and sometimes secondary suburbs of Chicago. There's still lots of opportunity. Um, I drove down Roosevelt, I drove up Washington, down Lake, uh, just to the west of here, and there are boarded up buildings which is amazing, right? Considering what you just heard from Kyle about what's going on with housing stock, uh, why things are so expensive. Uh, this is a conundrum. This is something that we're essentially relearning as a country because the way we used to build things, the wisdom of our ancestors, we're two generations, and sometimes three generations removed them. A little bit closer here in the Chicago region because these things are still happening and they're rebounding, especially since the recession. But we're going to talk about well, what's behind this. How do, how do the rents get so darn high? Uh, what happens in the real estate process that puts us in the situation we are today? Uh, and so I'm going to briefly start out by talking about the small development movement in our organization as a, as a bit of a context for uh, we became an organization in order to try to solve the implementation part of this. Uh, I've been involved uh, in the sort of urbanism world for uh, my whole career. And uh, it's interesting to see how, even though time has gone by, we haven't gotten a whole lot better at getting the projects done, especially in our, our core legacy neighborhoods uh, in our major cities. And I do a lot of work uh, in those cities, whether it be Atlanta or Memphis, starting some work in Albuquerque, uh, just finished a series of work in San Antonio. I'll be in Flint in a couple weeks. Uh, and uh, my new colleague is in Detroit and continues to sort of uh, watch things that are going on there. There are challenges, but there are challenges mostly because our development industry doesn't know what to do with the missing middle. They have no idea what it really is. And outside of probably some niche folks here in Chicago uh, who've been doing it for a long time, uh, most of the rest of the development community in, in the greater region uh, only knows how to do two or three things. What you see going on here uh, at the train station is one of those things, right? Large, in intense buildings with small units. Why are those units so small? Why, is, why are the rents so high? We'll talk about that today. It's probably not for the reasons you think, actually. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to simple mathematics. And we'll explain kind of how that works. All right, the clicker here. There we go. 
So the Incremental Development Alliance, uh, we are, our mission is to cultivate a thousand new small developers and, and have cities which support those developers. Why, why are we looking to support and, and cultivate these new uh, developing individuals? Well, we realize that it's the implementation stage. We have so many master plans, we have so many strategic plans, we have so many community plans, we have so many good ideas, but we, we always fall short of implementation. So our goal as an organization is to tackle that exact spot in the process. So the people we train, the private sector and nonprofit folks we train directly, our small business owners and neighborhood advocates, uh, designer, real estate professionals, builders, those are the folks who have one foot into the industry. It's very easy for them to transition. But over time now, lots of other people have come into the equation that we never expected uh, who to be involved in real estate. So our process starts from ground zero. We assume we know nothing about the real estate industry. What we do ask and what we do require is that you care about a place, you're rooted there, and you're committed to building the relationships and networks in a place to become successful in doing what's a very hard industry. Real estate's a very hard industry, it's a busy industry. We coach civic groups and government agencies to help change the rules, change the financing mechanisms, change a whole lot of things that are programmed for a different development pattern, a largely auto-oriented development pattern that's been very good at producing mini storage and single family house subdivisions, strip malls, and the occasional industrial office park, right? We can do those things all day. There are financing mechanisms for those uh, all over the place. We don't have the same variety and diversity of those conventional financing tools, although it's coming back around now. It's much different than it was five years ago. We're trying to help put things back together at the neighborhood scale. Chicago is a very large city. Right? We can't tackle a whole city all at once. We can tackle a neighborhood. That's where our local economy actually thrives. These places that have survived and have sometimes adverse conditions and are now thriving again here in Chicago, these neighborhoods, uh, are thriving because their baseline operating system has tremendous upside, uh, but also can tough it out, right, in the lean years. Our other development patterns we've done since, for, since World War II aren't aging as well. And so there's wisdom from our ancestors that we need to kind of revisit and we understand why these places continue to work uh, and why the ones we've made more recently uh, are not doing so well. Finally, connecting uh, both the, the implementers, the doers, and the folks supporting those in our communities. Uh, that's our third mission in our activity as an organization. So what do we define as this small incremental development? Well, first of all, uh, you see this graphic uh, in the, uh, the promotional materials. Uh, Jennifer emailed me and was like, oh my goodness, can you please, can we just, can we still that after the thing that put on all the flyers? That's, that's exactly what we need. And that's why we, we made this. This is kind of our informal logo uh, our, when we, uh, we did our branding earlier this year uh, because we wanted to be able to show in pictures. Because in so much of this, words don't do it justice. Right? All the way from the tent, right? What's that? What's going on with that? The tent? <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's a reason for that. All the way up to a, a building that is you know, ubiquitous in walking distance. We'll see a lot of these this afternoon. I'm sure there's two and three story buildings. Um, that's our definition, that one to three story scale, that constantly evolving and regenerating neighborhood. Neighborhoods that are locked in amber, like we can't change because of a regulatory system or other things, those are places that are going to uh, not evolve in a, in a prosperous manner. Uh, we have to continue to allow our neighborhoods to change and evolve uh, in a positive way. And we need an ecosystem that actually supports it to make that happen. So what do we hope to see uh, in this world of one to three story buildings at the neighborhood scale? This is what really comes down to it, what we're here to do. Uh, because this is what our, youth, our real estate access used to do in this country. This is how we became one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the world. We did so because we invested in a way that invested back in our communities. The frenzy in the 90s and 2000s to create jobs as our, our, our industrial uh, economy uh, slowed to a halt. And uh, we understand that here in the Midwest, how our economies are changed drastically in the last 25 years, has left us in a place where we have been chasing this idea of jobs, 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 jobs. But what does that really mean? How does that work? How is that tied to real estate? Well, if you want to start a donut shop, Right. You're an entrepreneur or want to become an entrepreneur and you want to start a donut shop. Now mind you, let me just remind you, just in case you've forgotten, what goes on in a donut shop. You get dough 
and you fry it in oil. Right? High tech, very, you need a master's degree to figure that out, right? No, you're frying dough in oil, right? This is not anything that needs some sort of sophisticated or high, you know, high knowledge activity. But if you want to start a, a, a donut shop, you have one of two options. You either can uh, pony up uh, quite a bit of cash and a net worth of $500,000 and start a Dunkin' Donuts, right? If you actually, if anyone ever actually gone to a website and read the requirements to start a franchise, uh, most recently I've seen a huge trend, uh, if you read some of the business magazines, most franchisees are not even allowing you to open a single franchise anymore. They've seen greater returns for people who want to open five restaurants at once or in short proximity. So you can't even just open one anymore. You gotta open three or four. And the requirements are double or triple this, right? To, to again, for the opportunity to fry, don't for fry dough. Okay? We look at a hope for a different model. We hope for a model, uh, we love donut shops, by the way, and uh, one of my co-founders, Monty Anderson, uh, you'll see in all of his development areas, uh, there's business donut shops popping up. And, and uh, snow cones in Dallas and donut shops is what goes on where he's at. We're looking to build wealth and use real estate as the tool. Because at the end of the day, if you've worked in, in, as a donut shop operator for 25 or 30 years, are you going to sell your donut shop for a half million dollars? Right? If you've been renting in the strip mall or renting you know, on a main street? No. Why would someone pay you a half million dollars for the opportunity to put dough in oil? Right? It doesn't make any sense. Only makes sense. The only way you actually have real equity and real value is if that donut shop is rooted in the place and it owns the place, that business, right? It owns the building, which is what's going on here. Anyone guess how old these buildings are? How old are these buildings? 100 years old? What else? 67 years old. Six. They're six years old. Right? But we haven't seen this building pattern, right, in, in 60 years. So we assume it's 60 years old, right? In fact, I think it's 1, 2, 3, what is it, 2017 now? Uh, it's five years old, I think, actually. This simple concept of a 25 or 30 foot wide building, right, which actually looks like this. It builds wealth. How does it do that? Well, it's a small building with a small footprint. And just in case, right, because it's a walkable mixed use place, with single family houses and other uh, multi-unit buildings nearby in a neighborhood, walking distance to a downtown, there's a 700 square foot apartment on the back. It is a one-story mixed-use building. Radical idea, right? But what happened? How did this come about? Well, the person who owned, who owns that donut shop sold their house in the recession, mind you, uh, and just out of the recession, actually, uh, and and they sold their house to have the equity to get an SBA loan to buy this building, which was brand new, newly constructed by one of my co-founding members, and stabilized the donut shop, spent their, their family for, lived in that 700 square foot apartment for two years, right? And then, when the business was, was cash flowing, working well, and rooted in a place where there was new development happening all around them, and the, continue, and the, and the appreciation of the building continued to rise, they moved, bought another house and now rented that back apartment, right? So now, because they own their building at a modest rate, it's a modest sized building, and they have someone paying seven, eight hundred dollars a month, which is like three quarters of their mortgage payment for the entire building, right? They're a business owner, they're a landlord, and they're building wealth. They'll probably be able to pay out building off in 15 something years, right? That's a very different model of being the store manager at a Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. What happens in the next recession on this in this neighborhood? Is this donut short you gotta pick up and leave? No, of course not. They're rooted, they're there. They're there for the long haul. Right? They don't get booted out, right? They don't get moved out to rising rents or falling conditions. That's the wealth and the stability we need to have in our neighborhoods. This is what we 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 are striving for uh, at the alliance. We need this supportive ecosystem for small developers to be able to do projects like this. If I, if I had a whole other hour, I could tell you about the PUD process necessary to put that building in in a large, a large planned development, right? 
it was it was a terrible, ridiculous process. It's also Texas, mind you, but um, it, that ecosystem is critical if we're actually getting our arms around this issue and being able to rebuild things and to supply the housing, especially that we need in a short period of time. We need lenders and investors to understand how these transactions of real estate development work at small scale. We need codes and processes that are that are actually scaled properly. We have a one-size-fits-all process for development in this country today, so it's just as hard to put a 40 building is and put a 40 or 400, more or less, in most places. That's difficult. The small developer can't handle that kind of overhead. And we also need to have a proper infrastructure, a big platform uh, for these buildings to plug into because they don't provide their own swimming pool in a four-unit building, right? They need a community. They need the, the shops on the corner. If you're building a townhouse, it requires a town, right? A townhouse, you need a town. It has to be, it has to be connected to other things. It can't be, you know, in a pod in a, in a parking lot out in the edge of the community. If you do this, why would you build a support an ecosystem for a small developer? Because as you'll see in, during my presentation, these small development patterns, not only are they robust right, and, and, can, and can, can ride the waves, but they also create a tax base that is stable. And it creates a tax base that has a much higher return on, on our on investment, which is why places, legacy cities of Chicago, continue to be able to thrive, because there's great value in places that even though um, they might be boarded up and abandoned, they're still amazingly valuable in many cases. And they're, they're not going to rise again very quickly. We need a higher return on our investment from our real estate to cover our, our <laughs> if you guys know in Chicago here, that you're very quickly rising infrastructure costs and your decades of deferred maintenance, right? That's not cheap. None of this stuff is cheap. You, you, need, a, you, need, a, you need a tax base to keep up and to, to backfill for the infrastructure that <coughs> is, is, is uh, failing. And you need locally owned businesses to be able to actually root that, that uh, wealth and keep it here in the community, continue to recycle it in the community. So I'll ask a quick question just to start off here. Who is seeing the kind of real estate development they want to see in, in Greater Chicago? So that, this is the point where you raise your hands. <laughs> One, two tentative hands. Boy, okay, well, <laughs> why aren't we getting the real estate development projects we want to see? <clears throat> why? So our real estate industry in a nutshell is structured around two major axes. It's structured around financing, just top to bottom here. We have corporate institutional financing, and we have entrepreneurial and bootstrap financing. And we plan and conceive of our places on, a, on the spectrum of small incremental to large and master plan. Most of the conventional development that we've done in the last 50 to 75 years is up in this upper right hand quadrant, right? The master plan, large, corporate, institutionally refunded, subdivision, large, you know, mixed use building, or at best, uh, but more likely the huge industrial park, the huge office park, uh, the speculative developments. Right? Those things are all happening at a large scale and they, they require large money. Even large housing, right? One, 200, 300 unit apartment uh, complexes. Well, if you try to do a small incremental project with a large REIT, how do you think that would go? Yeah, not so well. Actually, not at all. Right? Because you have mismatch objectives. And if you try to uh, build something that was large and master plan with entrepreneurial bootstrap money, uh, you'll be working on that for a really long time, right? So, but if you had small incremental with entrepreneurial bootstrap and, and a very savvy bit of maybe conventional financing, you find a match point. But it's sort of the great unknown right now. It's sort of, uh, it's very fuzzy. It's something that hasn't been well practiced. There's not a lot of understanding. So that's why we exist as an organization. We're trying to rebuild the knowledge about how to operate in this lower left hand quadrant. So if that wasn't a challenge enough, right? we don't know even how to put these things back together anymore, uh, we have some statistics. And I was looking at Kyle's, and I also think I'm going to steal his slides there. I think he's, he's got a few years uh, later data now. Um, this number is uh, almost exactly what it was though, uh, 10 years. The slide I just saw on the bottom this morning said 62%. So we're making great strides to lower the amount of single family housing in this country over the last 10 years. Right? We went from 63% to 62%. Right? And this number is greatly, greatly diminished uh, you know, by the large metropolitan areas like Chicago, New York, Seattle, who are, really, who are building housing units at an incredible pace. 
Uh, and so this number is, is higher in most places in the country outside the, the biggest large, uh, metropolitan regions. Right? Here it actually might be this, uh, but it's, it's not in most places that we work in the country. So why is this a big deal that our single family housing stock is a majority of what we have? And what, well, because of this number. I'm pausing so you guys can read this slide. I always get a while or two. Because that's, that's, a, that's a stark statistic. 83% of all households in the US in just under 13 years will have no children. So let me connect that search for you. We have a, 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 a majority of our housing stock operating at probably a three bedroom, two bathroom suburban house. And we have a country that in 13 years is a while or two. That's, that's, a, that's a star statistic. 83% of all households in the US in just under 13 years that have no children. So let me affect that answer for you. We have a, 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 a majority of our housing stock operating at probably a three bedroom, two bathroom suburban house. And we have a country that in 13 years has a lot of children. That's a star statistic.
for in a very obvious manner. It's finding a way to do things legally, or maybe 74 to 70, in order to get the thing done that we want to have done, that we all agree upon needs to happen as a community, as a neighborhood. And we have to keep those, all the different types of requirements in line. There are financing requirements, there are building code requirements, there are uh, zoning code requirements, there are other market-based requirements. We have to keep all those in close proximity to each other so that one of those does not uh, basically become the uh, limiting reactant to a project. We're going to talk a lot more today and see this afternoon about using building types that are reliable, that fit on small lots. They're not reinventing the wheel. We have, we have, as a country, as a civilization, know how to build small buildings. If we can just remember and open our eyes to see how we used to do it, right? It's all been figured out. There are thousands of these units in Chicago and, and, and millions across the country, but we have to go back and learn the best from those ideas and modernize those to 21st century requirements. Uh, this is a huge tool that we have. We're going to talk more about this this afternoon in our panel, I'm sure, is maximizing the 30-year mortgage. Why is that important? What do we use the 30-year mortgage for? Get to that. Very important for today's conversation is how, understanding how a building makes money, right? If you do not understand how a building makes money as a small developer, you become a former small developer very quickly, right? <laughs> now, notice I did not say how a, the building makes lots and lots of money. I said how a building makes money. Every building has to make money. Right? Otherwise, as a, as, a, as a entity, as a business, it does not continue, right? It defaults, it uh, goes into disrepair, right? There has to be a continuing cash flow in a building for it to stay a useful uh, asset and a useful place to house people and to have activities. Finally, uh, we have to get our financing together. Uh, we have to get our package together. Because the biggest reason uh, that you don't have more small developers today isn't because you don't have the money. Trust me, there's more money in this country looking for a place to park itself and invest itself for a return than we have useful things to invest it in. It's probably shocking to you, but it's really true. Every place I've gone to, regardless of economic or uh, you know whatever the socioeconomic data says, there's more money in every community in this country looking to find a place to park itself. And without pitch packages, a, a financial and uh, site plan uh, and a, a, a combination of, of items that show you how a building will make money and how it will be the need in the marketplace, we have no place to park that capital. So we need folks who can create these packages to show how our real estate development project works. So say you're all in. Say I'm going to sign up. I'm going to sign up and join join the, the recruits for becoming a small developer because I care about my neighborhood and I'm not seeing the development I want to have in my in my place. What would I do as a small developer? What should which I do? What should I start with? So I'm going to ask most of the ladies on this one. How many ways can you wear? A little black dress. Endless. Endless. <laughs> Why is that? You can dress it up. You can dress it down. You can accessorize. Right? What are our little black dress buildings in our in our in our in the cities that neighbors that we love? They always look like this, right? The black dress blue blazer buildings, right? They're versatile. They stand the test of time, right? We said 76 years at the average age of a building like this in Chicago. How to get that far? Why are the other ages so low, right? Why is it so affordable? Well, because we built a lot of them, and we built them really well, especially in this part of the world, right? We both we mostly build things today out of sawdust and a little bit of you know sticky glue, right? Right? Not building like this, right? That's going to be there and in high demand, right? I want to talk briefly about a little bit more about missing middle. And if you really dig deep into well, what's the exact sort of definition, why why is this missing middle idea as humans, right? Not as planners and architects and, and, and urbanist nerds, right? We got to step out of that for a second today and say, why as humans does this work so well for us? Why do we have a comfort level? with a building like the one I just showed, right? That fits in this missing middle spectrum. And not just housing, by the way, too. Also, you know, commercial buildings can scale as well. Because they look like the thing that we have now grown accustomed to as a culture, 
as the sort of comfort of home, the place that's sort of idealistic cultural place, right? a single family house. Missing little buildings from the street typically have no more than two doors, most of the time just one. Hey, look at all these buildings down here, right? This was the side of the building, actually. The glass was the front, but it was also the side of this, right? One and two doors, right? It's at the scale of a building that is easy to digest as a human, right? One, two, two and a half, maybe three stories, right? Most missing middle buildings, though, are one to two stories. And they have that scale where you can't tell walking down the street if that's one units, two units, eight units, or 12 units, right? That's what makes the missing middle so impactful right, and acceptable to us as humans, right? Because we can't tell the difference unless we walk around the back of the building and start counting gas meters or electrical meters, right? But we don't know how many units are inside that building walking down the street. That's what seamlessly allows these buildings to fit in no matter where they go, right? Who wouldn't want this building, right? Is that building dangerous? Right? Is that an end, right? Are those signs that Kyle showed earlier, right? We're mad about this building. I don't think there's gonna be too many people picketing this building, even though it probably is approach, approaching 40 to 50 units to the acre. Now, if you show up at a community meeting and say, we're gonna build a new multifamily rental housing building, and it's gonna be 40 to 50 units to the acre, right? You'll be run out of that meeting, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Pitchforks, right? This is like a soft, cuddly teddy bear, right? Look at this. Like two stories, right? There's a front elevation, or being a long, you know, maybe on a corner, you know, you have two sides, right? This fits well. So here's here's where you come in. Who do we need to have in the, in the ecosystem of small development to make this work? Well, we need these following three groups: small developers, small investors, and small and community champions, right? What do each of these groups do? Well, the first group is a group of the hustle, right? They are pulling all the pieces together. They're the people who you think of as the developer, right? What you don't necessarily understand is that these other two groups are working behind the scenes to actually make that developer's work happen or not happen. The second group is a critical part today, especially when we're talking about the affordability of housing, we're talking about reinvesting in places that have a problem making the appraisal, and what happens, why do buildings not make appraisals, by the way? Because they cost more to build than they are worth. How does that happen? Right? right? Well, there are negative factors in that neighborhood, in that local marketplace, that somehow magically make it sell less than the cost to build a new, new thing or rehab it. Right? That, that's an ecosystem problem. That's not a problem of the individual block. We have to solve that with our social capital right, and our financial capital. That's why we need investment partners. We need people who are, who are interested in investing in the neighborhood, not just the project. We need financial institutions, foundations, who can provide patient capital and financing to overcome that until the appraisals catch up right, with, with the value of that place. And we need champions who understand the role of both of the groups above them right, to create an environment for both of them to work to do this very uh, sort of trying process to make it happen together. So just to be able to, to give you a quick, sort of see it a little bit larger, right? Are, are you one of these folks right, on this screen, in this room? Or are you one of these folks? Or are, are you one of these folks? Anybody here not on one of those three screens? Good. Now you're all going to be part of the small development, small development movement, right? <laughs> Easy. We, we need everyone. This, this is a heavy, heavy lift. There's a role for everybody. I want to explain what everybody can do to start. You can buy an existing building, right? This is, this is a really ubiquitous building here um, in both the Northeast and, and here in this part of the Midwest, right? Three-story flat. Buy an existing building, lots of them here. Uh, rehabbing a house. Does it look like a house to you? No, but it sure actually is when, when, you're, when you're talking to the FHA. Right, because this is a three-unit building, three half, three half, three residential units, with some non-residential space. It's a house. We can get a 30-year mortgage from this building. I'll talk a little more about that in just a second. Or you can build a fourplex, or a twoplex, or a threeplex, 
or uh, I also like to call this a building where somebody else pays your rent. Right? If you own it, someone else is paying your mortgage. Right? That's a terrible thing. Right? Someone else is paying your mortgage payment for you? Horrible. Who would want that? I mean, I can't imagine how you build wealth that way. Right? Finance, you know, if it's new construction or even a rehab, finance with a construction loan from a local bank and take it out with a 30-year conventional FHA, Fannie, Freddie, VA loan, a federally backed insured loan. Right? Almost any bank in the country does a loan like this. But not all of them actually middle that a one to four unit building is actually qualifies. Even with a little non-residential space under a certain percentage threshold. Right? This is information that as a culture we don't know anymore. We lost the information. There's a thousand page manual put out by HUD that explains in great detail how this works. But no one's read that, so it's un under it's misunderstood and under uh, under well known, right? So in this part of the world, it's probably better well known, right? Because of the percentage of the housing stock you have fits those requirements. But in most places I go to, uh, this is people are asking me for you know page you know 462 in the thousand page manual to prove to somebody at their bank that this is actually truth. Right? They've never heard of such a thing. Now here's the other thing you might not understand. What is the configuration of that one to four units, right? I have everybody, we do this in our training sessions, right? One, two, three, four attached units on a single lot owned by a single entity. That is a house. Say it with me. Four units, a house. Yes. Right? Also could be a house, right? Four <laughs> units, right? A little parking in the back. Right, maybe it's future expansion. Right, that's also a house. Right, doesn't matter the configuration. All that matters is that it's not more than four units. And by golly, do not make five units. That's no longer a house. That's like your, that's like a teenage, you know, boy or girl hitting puberty, and all of a sudden that fly is not that you know, adorable child you, you knew right when they were younger. Right, it's a completely really monstrous thing. It's a commercial building. Four units, a house. Okay. What if you're not going to become a small developer? What if you, you know, already own a place and you're comfortable, you know, paying your own mortgage? You know, you're really, really you're, you're satisfied with paying your own mortgage. You're not going to, you're not going to, you know, go buy a duplex or you know, build one. Well, uh, if you're in the city government or if you were consulted working to help those types of agencies, um, here's the things that cities can do to uh, work on their rules. Right? We need to actually start measuring things differently. We need to look, actually do the math of the kind of development that we're allowing our community, not just by zoning, but by uh, the way that it returns capital to our community, right? What it pays in property taxes. Um, Kyle mentioned this earlier. Uh, we need to stop guessing about how much parking we need, right? We're really bad at that. We've, we've been bad at that for decades. Uh, we're still not any good at it, even after all this time. And so in most places that are functioning, walkable places like we have here in Chicago, um, we don't need to guess anymore. We need to invest in our infrastructure in order to allow uh, us to you know, house people and house activities that stimulate our economy as opposed to house uh, large hunks of metal. This is not saying that, that cars should be outlawed or you shouldn't have a place for them, but it needs to be priced appropriately. Right? If you want to have a car, that's fine. Right? You actually have to pay for the cost to store and operate that car. That cost in this country today, with insurance and everything else, is not cheap. But we've subsidized it so long that we don't remember what the real costs are. And we, as municipalities, uh, are having time. We, we, is anybody, is anybody here that have a, a municipality that's just flush with money? Anybody? Wave your one. I think there's probably one or two. There's only one or two in every region, right? But we people don't usually live in that place. Like somebody else lives in that place, right? And so uh, a couple other things that get in the way, right, are uh, why, our, why our cities are kind of going broke is because they have lots of infrastructure costs and they have things that they're trying to fix uh, on environmental issues like stormwater codes and so forth. So we ask folks, we go throughout the country, and we, we, we actually talk to them about stress testing their, develop, their environment. To actually act like a small developer, put a building on a lot, run a pro forma, and see what happens. Is it possible to build a triplex anywhere in your city? Not, it's not possible in my city. Right? We just fixed the 25-year-old rules, rules so that the places we had zoned R2 could actually have duplexes on them. Because that wasn't really possible because of the strange rule about lot requirement. Right? 
But triplexes, heck no. No, no, you're not going to get a triplex anywhere in Minneapolis, right? So why not? Right? We have triplexes all over the place. They're, they're on the auction block right now because there's bidding wars for triplexes and quadplexes in, in my city, right? There's, there's such high demand. So we need to find out what's going on, what things, what things are not working. Here's an example of looking at those rules very closely, right? How do we build that simpler, cheaper building that can also look good, right? One of those principles we talked about in the eight uh, at the beginning. Well, by finding ways to say not have to put, have to put a $75,000 elevator in every modest three-story walk-up building, right? How do you do that? Well, you have to still meet federal uh, housing, uh, the Federal Housing uh, Act, right? Federal Housing Act, which requires 100% of the ground floor units of any building to be accessible, adaptable. Okay, so how many residential units do we have in the ground floor of this building? One. That unit is accessible adaptable. What is the percentage of accessible adaptable units we have in the ground floor of this building? 100%. Right. That's code hacking, right? We need cheaper buildings because construction costs are the one thing that's actually the thing that's driving most of our problems in terms of housing affordability. We can't afford how many how many elevators do we have in three-story buildings that in these 76-year-old zero, right? We don't have them. Because you can't afford them on a 12 unit building like this, right? This is a three story building, that's this four units every floor. So nine is an extra units. You can actually put 12 if you want to, on the ground floor, right? We have to figure out how to make these projects work, work on paper, figure out what's holding us up first, right? This is a one page performer we use in our one day training courses to help people understand how a building makes money, all right? Lots of, lots of boxes filled in by hand with your cell phone calculator, right? That's how it really makes money. That's how complicated it is, right? If you ever thought that a real estate developer was this genius, right, and this financial, you know, uh, savant, no, this is seventh grade math at best. Who passed seventh grade math? Good. You can all become small developers, right? I, I mentioned before low bar barrier to entry. I wasn't kidding about this, okay? Um, this is one thing I want to start trying to help people understand about why we're in trouble in terms of construction costs, right? It is not that developers are greedy or need lots of money to, or that, that they are looking to make lots of profit. They are looking to make profit, but they're not really making that much, right? The way developers actually make obscene amounts of profits has nothing to do with the construction or rehab of a building, right? That's the riskiest, most cost-intensive part of it. They make money through uh, having land holdings that appreciate over time, right? They bought the land at the right price at the right time. The building thing is sort of the necessary evil to make it actually pay off. But the cost is the cost is the cost is the cost, right? If you build a one-stair walk-up building, right, you need a dollar twenty-five per square foot in this region, this is Albuquerque, right, to cover the cost of that building, right? Now, what if you're building one of these concrete podium with an elevator buildings that like we see down the street here, right? In Albuquerque, you need two dollars a square foot. I'm pretty sure here in Chicago, that's probably almost three dollars a square foot. Okay, so if you have a 500 square foot apartment, right? Probably a pretty, a pretty roomy apartment, one of these new buildings, 500 square feet. At three dollars a square foot, that's fifteen hundred dollars, right, for a one bedroom apartment, maybe. That's how the math works. It's a really expensive building to put one or two elevators in, long double loaded corridors, pools, common space. All that stuff costs money to put you know, a building that size in. That's why you see the rents you see. It's not because people are making obscene profits. It's because these buildings are really expensive. Okay? And so we have to understand how we can build a smaller scale. Because in the most cases, in most parts of the country, maybe here in Chicago, we can do this more often. Right? You can see this. In most places in the country, we will never see four to six story buildings, right? Because they cost too much. You can't afford them. I want to show you a couple projects. These are the faces of our growing movement. We have over 1,500 alumni of our training courses in the last two years. Um, these are a couple of their projects. It's Alec Quinlan in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Three lovely little cottages, right? One with a, one with a backyard cottage, right? This is Jay Martin in Chattanooga, Tennessee, right? Taking an old tired muffler shop, this building right here. Right, you can see the floor plan. You put a two, three-story walk-up building on your side of the parking behind and turn that into commercial. Right? No elevators, the corridors, simple buildings in an up-and-coming neighborhood in Chattanooga. 
Okay? Ryan Terry is working on a fourplex. You actually put the two of them. Ryan's a Marine. He's, he's a veteran of our country. And he's taking advantage of a very lovely no uh, down payment takeout loan for a fourplex that we, that we give to those who have served. Okay? And you can see he's building, he, he, he's the dog that caught the, caught the bus. He, he, uh, he won an RFP in a small, small town, Bryan, Texas, for an entire block. Uh, this happened to be at one of our very early training sessions. Like he got the email that he won the RFP. How did he win the RFP? Uh, he was the only one who responded. Because <laughs> the only thing you to do with a single block in a small town, right, in Texas, right? This is near College Station, actually. So he, they help, we help figure, help him figure out how to break this block into, into six buildings and have the city sell it to him in, in, in one parcel at a time. Because they wanted the big money shot, three-story mixed-use building with a grocery store on Main Street. Anyone can guess how much that would cost, right? In an area that had comps half that rate. Okay, so he started by building these two modest quadplexes and build two more next year. And then slowly over time, as the neighborhood starts to come up and, that, and, the, and the real estate market starts to come in line with those prices, maybe we can get that three-story building the way we want it. But we need that incremental process to help us get us there. Okay? So I'm going to quickly go through two quick projects that we are doing in communities to help them make these tweaks and these adjustments to their ecosystem, right? to get these things rolling back the way they should again when, when small development is your desired outcome. In Chattanooga, this is a lovely building, uh, 1500 Duncan. This is a building that people, everybody knew in town, right? People just by looking at it, it was amazing. It was in a great neighborhood uh, just down the street from the university, but just far enough over, over a railroad track and a cemetery that it was the next up and coming neighborhood. It wasn't quite there yet. Right. But it was 100 years old, it was sort of the stalwart of that place. And so the new development that was happening in Chattanooga, this is the neighborhood, this is downtown Chattanooga, right, we'll need that, that cemetery. This was not, this was seeing a tremendous amount of disinvestment. And so a foundation and a local nonprofit brought us there to help think through how to look at the DNA of the missing middle housing types of that place and put together a, a playbook of those typologies, right, that looks like this. There were 15 types that we actually put, placed them on lots. Every lot in that neighborhood was 50 feet wide by 135 feet deep with an alley. Okay, what can we do? A one lot, two lot, three lots, right, with these basic building types. Then we sat down and did performance and said, okay, what would it take to build these things if I was a small developer here today? We tested it, okay. We also sat down with trades and ask them, hey, if you build this quadplex, how much is the air conditioning really gonna cost, right? What's it gonna do with that sewer tap and the fire sprinkler system we gotta put in a quadplex? Yeah, so you can put a sprinkler system in a quadplex nowadays, thanks to the new zoning, the new building code. So we have this report, you can download it from the, our, our website, um, that talks about looking at testing these projects. We actually took four of the 15 models and we went all the way through this process of being able to say, okay, how would this get done? The reason we were doing this was twofold. The, the nonprofit realized that it could not deliver all the housing necessary in the city. It needed the private sector, and they had a bunch of great people doing single family cottages for them, a bunch of building developer types who didn't know how to do anything else. And so the idea of this playbook was to be able to help sell them lots that the nonprofit owned so they could increase their capacity and speed up the process of building small scale housing in their community, as well as to test out. So they're actually in the process of putting construction documents together. Uh, for about 30 lots in this, in this area. Um, we also have to deal with this little, this little sticky problem of stormwater management. Um, I don't have a lot of time left, but we'll talk more about that this afternoon in terms of uh, the modern day environmental requirements and how they're mis, uh, sort of misallocated uh, requirements. But in most every city I've gone to, single family houses exempted from stormwater requirements, which is funny because single family houses make up usually 75% of the geographic area in our city. So that means we're putting the other 25% on notice for, for sort of picking up the rest. Turns out that's really expensive, actually. We actually tested what it would take to do stormwater based on the existing requirements that were mostly set up for acre sites or larger. So you're working at a tenth of an acre, it gets really hard. Okay? It starts to bury lots of pipe under the ground, which is akin to digging a hole, putting pallet loads of cash in the hole, and then putting the dirt back onto it, right? That's, that's what stormwater requirements do for, storm, for small projects if they're not well calibrated. So we're working on rezoning, we're working on assembling packages that can be built by the private sector in conjunction in a neighborhood of the up and coming with a nonprofit and trying to work for and figure out if our assumptions and the things that we figured we can do are actually possible. 
The second thing I want to show you, because uh, I know there's a certain number of folks in this room who are going to love looking at nerdy uh, walking diagrams and, and zoning classifications. There's a few of you, I'm sure, just a couple. Um, this is Columbus, Georgia, an area called Hood Town, just on the west of the downtown. This is the neighborhoods from the 19 teens to 1960s, all the way out. You can see how lots get smaller and larger, right? They have tax allocation district, which is this TIF, right? That they had over this, this area in the blue. This is what their housing and, and the commercial development looked like in that area, right? Amazing old housing stock, beat up old buildings, some houses that were, were lovely but needed a little work, right? They did a stress test. They tried to figure out why they weren't seeing the development they wanted to see in their community. What did we find? Extremely low commercial rents, excessive parking burdens. The zoning basically made some of the small lots that were under 37 square feet just illegal to build on all together. They had a housing crisis and they couldn't build on entire lots, sets of lots in a low income neighborhood, right? This doesn't make any sense. And the zoning made all kinds of multi unit development very difficult. This is a section of what supposedly is the rules in their place. This, now, when the city gives you a, a guidebook, you would expect that these rules down here, these numbers, correspond to these pictures. Right? That would be a normal assumption of why you would illustrate pictures. Yeah, no, not at all. This is actually what goes on when you apply the rules to that place. This is what you what you could get, what, what you get on this side. But what you could happen under those same rules. That looks a little different than this, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is a major problem we have in our country today. We actually don't know what our rules really say, for better or for worse. Right? We actually went through and, and actually said, well, if we change a couple of rules, we don't think this is all that swell, and some people there don't either. Um, so if we change, this is the exact code table out of their new code, right? And if we change these numbers to these numbers, we could go from this to this. Somebody just look through these. Well, what's going on over here? Oh, that's right. Those, those are lots you can't build on. Yeah, we just don't allow that. You know, there's 37 foot lots. Yeah, you can't build on those things. Yeah. Single family house, yes, but anything more than single family house. In a multi family, residential multi family, you can build a single family house, but no more. This was a modest duplex, right? Look at these funky buildings, right? On a corner. Don't even try to build a building on a corner, right? That's, that's just going to be it's awkward, right? Quadplex, right? Got a little carried away and put a granny flat on back. Right? This is parking grid, right? Six unit building, 12 unit building. There's enough parking allowed by right to support 12 units, but not based on the density requirements. Can you imagine the value breaker difference right, between this building and this building with the same amount of parking and the same amount of stormwater? Right? The amount of lost tax base? Right? You, oh, no, oh, by the way, I mentioned there was extremely low commercial rents and rather decent residential rents. So what should we do? Well, we should build more residential, maybe in mixed use capacity on our commercial. Oh, no, 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 no. No residential units on our commercial lots, even though you can get half the rent. Right? That'd be a terrible thing to, right? So, oh, this is this is lovely, right? This is their general commercial. This is completely driven by parking, right? There's parking underneath that building. Thank goodness the economics of that place don't work. You'd never see this building because it's too expensive to build. A four-story building over a parking, right? You know, you can't get there with 75, 75 cents a square foot rent. It doesn't work. <laughs> Thank God. But the fact that if somebody did have more money than this, <laughs> wanted to build this, you couldn't stop them. Right? This is what the community doesn't know about their own rules, right? And that most of this is not legal in any way, shape, or form. It could be built on the same size lot. This is what that looks like. Changing the top line to the bottom line. Five zones, some sub-zones, right? This is it, these are your text amendments. Not a new form-based code, not a complete overhaul, right? A few numbers changing, right? Keep it as a down low, right? Not the droid you're looking for, no, no big deal. We'll put this on the consent agenda, no big deal, right? That's what we have to do. We have to, we have to kind of work through this, not make a big deal about it, help get our rules to be sensible, work in small pieces, all right? This is the value breaker. Unfortunately, green is not good in this case. Red is good in this case. That's high value breaker. So can you imagine where we want to put the changes to the zoning, right? We want to help those green areas become more yellow and red, right? That improves the tax base in this place. So home stretch, how do we learn more about this? Well, as it turns out, <laughs> 
my organization will be hosting a one-day workshop in South Bend, Indiana, not far from here, uh, in a couple weeks. And there's more information, I think, in your packets. I'll be sending it out afterwards. Um, I think we're at 199 now for registration rate. Uh, you can visit us at incrementaldevelopment.org. We help to take all these things we talked about this morning and break them down one piece at a time. Right? We talk about how do you formulate a project. Because if you, if you can't formulate a project, you can't do a project. Now that's what we realize in the educational process we need the most of. We have people need help figuring out how to make all these complex things work at the beginning so we can have a product to move forward. We, we, we look more at the financial financing tools, like that 30-year mortgage and what it can do. Building types, a financial performa, how do you guys for money? What do you need to do to buy this property and close? And we actually try all these things out by a practice project like we do to you know, test in our communities. So, We've got a lot today. We're going to continue to talk about the subject. I'm really glad we're going to get out of this room and go walk around and see it. This is a living laboratory in the city. And I want you to remember that while we're going to talk about a lot of challenges today, um, we, we, I want to introduce you to the patron saint of the Incremental Development Alliance, the person whose ethos we truly love and understand because we know we can't get there in big leaps. We know we don't always have the tools and resources we want to have to make the thing we can see we want to happen. We have to do the best we can with what we have. We can't wait and wait and wait for the perfect. Which is why the diver is our patron saint. <laughs> right? A little bit of chewing gum and a paper clip. Right? This is how we're going to move forward together. So thank you so much. go back um, quite a few slides. You had five bullet points up. One was stormwater regulations, one oh, yeah. was cost of development, a couple other things. Yeah, I knew, I knew you guys would like that. This one here or further up? More, more back. Okay. Oops. Let's go back. Let's see. What can we do here? Probably like slide 25 or so. Yeah, there you go. go. It's good. It's back here. Um, and the question probably is about what, what can we do? What, what, what are more to those things about uh, not not that I just I, I saw a a little bit of a kind of a conflict there yeah but I wanted to ask you about sure. it right here in my community okay um, <laughs> so municipal return on investment a lot of times we hear that development should pay the cost of, of of expansion and so one way we do that in my community for example is that we charge a an impact fee per new dwelling unit you introduce to the city sure. um, I don't remember how much that is but it's like I've got a thousand dollars per unit. Yeah, yeah, thirteen unit development, about a hundred thousand dollars, which of course is, I assume, death for a small incremental development. I'm not gonna help. What's your response to that? If you know, we should be worried about the return on investment, but we should be, arguably, in some people's minds, subsidizing small developers by not charging these fees. So, a couple assumptions in that. Uh, first of all, um, where is this being built? in your town? A place there's no infrastructure? <coughs> central Business District. Central Business District, okay. So uh, are there any pipes in the ground in Central Business District? Are there any sewer pipes and water pipes? Electricity the excise fees and questions are actually for park dedication and schools, so okay. we don't get any But I'm just asking you, is yeah, it there? Do you is have, there. everything is there. Okay. So do you have to build it new? Nope. Maybe you have to fix it up, right? Maybe it's 100 years old. So where do we get impact fees from? Where in the world did we figure out impact fees? Why do we do this? Well, mostly to cover the costs of new infrastructure, right? To extend our infrastructure, right? Because we don't want to extend our infrastructure speculatively. We want to extend our infrastructure to a place that's going to create a return on infrastructure, right? Because you can't just put a bunch of houses out in the middle of the field because they, they don't have water or sewer or any of those other things, right? We have mistakenly applied that same thought process because our cities are broke and have very bad return on their investment that they've already gotten. So they're looking to try to, to take that out of the one thing that they do have coming into the city in terms of revenue, which is new development. So we, we sort of transfer this idea of the impact fee, but what is that new 12 unit development in your central business really impacting? <coughs> it's actually rebuilding your tax base that's probably a big goose egg right now. Right? or is on a parking lot, or is on an underutilized vacant lot. But 
But in a central business district, we, we look about uh, this value for acre thought process. If you're familiar with the work of Joe Minicosi, Urban 3, you check this out, urban3.com. Um, what he finds, and he's done this 150 places over the country, that property near the central business district is usually riddled with underutilization. If it's next to a lovely three or six story building that's 100 years old, what's the most valuable investment that a city could make? Making the empty lot next to their six story building something that's not an empty lot. Because the value of that six or three story building is putting off the adjacency. The reason why central businesses are so potent to your tax base is that they feed off each other, right? It's the ecosystem. And so a, a 12 unit building next to something else that's very valuable already in, in your downtown actually is exponential return on investment than it does something in the edge of town. Because it's not next to anything, right? It's incrementally more because it goes from zero to something. But it's not, it's not exponential, it's additional. And so when we think about impact fees, uh, we like to understand, how do your impact fees calculate about the way? Uh, uh, per, per dwelling in, there's a little bit of adjustment for apartments versus single family versus. Got it. Things. Okay, so what does that do? Does that does that help you build large units or small units? I haven't charted it out to be honest. Yeah. yeah, it's really it's it's just number of units more than it is the size of. You know. <laughs> Correct. So what what we just learned today, right? We need to build smaller units, right? Which cost the same. So if I build 50 studio apartments or five studio apartments. Right? It's the same impact fee as three bedroom, two baths, or luxury condos. Right? Housing affordability is, is tied in weird ways to old practices that don't make sense in our urban neighborhoods, in our walkable places, where the infrastructure is already there. We've taken a thought process and practices and we've misapplied them for what the return is. So if you actually look at a building like the one you're talking about, a 12 bit, 12 bit building, and you project out what it's going to be worth, which is very easy, by the way, that one page pro forma, we'll be able to tell you how much that building is worth in a very close <coughs> calculations, and then multiply that by your tax rate, you can actually understand, oh my goodness, how much more might this building be worth? If you put the same building three miles away, it would be worth less, most likely, because being near other buildings that are valuable <coughs> makes that building worth more than just the cost to construct it. And so we need impact fees and we need, we need things that are helping to offset the cost of our infrastructure because we have aging infrastructure in those, in those central business districts, no doubt. But if that's our ATM machine, we shouldn't gum up the, the credit card you know, entry point by saying, well, no, you know, actually, you know, we're going to charge you a $150 fee to get your money out of the bank. Even though we're an ATM machine, our job here is to actually give money out. It's going to give you a high fee to actually get your money out. This is how we think as municipalities, because we are used to this never-ending growth process, which doesn't actually work for small-scale projects. At, at the era we built this neighborhood, right, that's right around us, they were building one block at a time, right? One lot at a time. Okay. They weren't basically plotting all the infrastructure out first, right? They built, they, they had a, they had a, they had a, they had platted, you knew the street was going to go, but you didn't build the street until you got something there, right? But it was waiting for you, right? That, that lot, lot structure was waiting for you. So these are, these are common things. I, I hear this all over the place about uh, how, do we, how do we get impact fees? Well, you should look at the total cost, the total re return of that building to your tax base. Your tax base might be very differently structured than somebody else's in this room. If you don't have a handle on where um, you get the best investment in your city, you can't actually create formulas that properly charge the right cost for that return on that investment. If you know that your central business district is going to give you the biggest bang for your buck, you should make it as easy as possible to make those products happen until you don't have any more of those lots. And then you might have to change your, your formula. But in most central business districts that I see in this country today, a big town or a small town, uh, we have way more underutilized lots that are actually missed opportunities for our tax base than we have problems where, you know, we see out here in this main street, right, where, you know, we have, we're at a peak condition and every square inch is, is really valuable. Most of our places are not like that. And so we have to rethink uh, how we how we charge for infrastructure based on that return. Thank you. All right. Well, I hope. Thank you, Jim. I hope you'll keep stewing on all your questions. We'll have plenty of time to dive deeper into these issues uh, in the afternoon session. 
Um, but next up is our walking tour led by uh, Rob Raymeyer, who I'll properly introduce in one minute. Um, I just want to go over a few logistics. So next up is our, um, for the walking tour, since we're such a large group, we're going to have Rob make a few remarks in the room. And then after that, we'll take a 10 minute break, maybe a little less since we're running behind. Um, and then we'll reorganize out front of the library to depart promptly um, at 11.30. Uh, you sh the room will be secured and attended to, so you can feel free to leave anything of your belongings here. I do want to point out a few things. You should take your folder with you. Um, there's some resources in there pertaining to the walking tour that I'll highlight really quick. Um, first off, there's some great materials from missingmiddle.com. Um, this includes some of the characteristics that Kyle touched upon, but it also has some great diagrams that show how the missing middle can be uh, distributed through a neighborhood block. Much of that you'll see in real life on our walking tour. Um, after, so the walking tour, you have a map here. It's roughly one mile. We may short it up because of the heat. Um, but we'll end the tour in the, the neighborhood just two to three blocks due north of the library. And at that point, we'll start our documentation uh, exercise. Uh, so you can see at the intersection that we'll end at on the aerial map in your folder, there's a great mix of buildings. You've got, I think there's a duplex on one corner, a six lot on another, um, and a couple of larger apartment buildings. So whatever building intrigues you the most, you should feel free to go grab a clipboard um, and bring your pen. And then we have a couple of uh, templates in there, one filled out and one blank. So you have about 20 to 30 minutes to actually put pen to paper um, and really dive into the nitty gritty, sketch the elevations, uh, pace off the building and fill in this document. And what we found is that when you start looking at the parameters of these buildings, uh, you start to understand what the implications are and how it connects with, with the context. Um, we also hope it'll start to question, make you question, the regulatory frameworks uh, that may or may not be supporting these buildings. So then you'll be responsible to get yourself back here. Lunch will be served around 12.30 in this room. Um, so with that, let me introduce our fearless leader, Rob. Rob has led the Oak Park Regional Housing Center since 2006. He has overseen the expansion of the center's programs, including its advocacy role for fair housing and the initiation of a home ownership program serving Western Chicago and Western Cook County. Uh, he has trained hundreds of industry professionals on compliance with fair housing law and is currently board president of Chicago Area Fair Housing Alliance and sits on the steering committee of Building One America Coalition, the Illinois Community Investment Coalition, and the Housing Oak Park. So we couldn't think of a better expert to guide us on our tour today. Um, and after his remarks, we'll take a 10 minute break and then meet out front. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Oak Park. We're going to take a very short walking tour uh, through the community. Um, we can do this because you know Oak Park is a community with an older housing stock in it, and therefore we have a lot of these building types that we're all very interested in. And actually, that mix of building types has been really critical to our community's success. So, um, you know, a lot of people look to Oak Park and they they think about it in a couple of different ways. We're famous for a couple of things. We're famous. Because frankly, Wright did a lot of work here. Um, we're actually really not that far away from where a lot of his poems uh, were. Uh, but you'll see how, even though we're just a couple blocks away from sort of the heart of that mansion type area, uh, there's also lots of different uses that are sitting right next door to it. Um, we're also famous for uh, you know being a community that's really fostered and uh, you know been intentional about diversity and integration. That's the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, um, you know, and some people just think of us as this really nice western suburb that, you know, you want to try and figure out if you can figure out a way to move into. Um, and all three of those things work together, though. I mean, our built environment and our work towards trying to create a community where everyone feels welcome 
together create the community that makes you know, the place that makes this such a wonderful community to live in. It has its own real sense of place. So um, you're going to see how the built environment plays a role in that, and that we don't have you know blocks and blocks and blocks of single family homes only. That single family homes and two flats and rental, you know, multi family buildings all kind of mix in together. And that really happens all the way throughout the community. Obviously, we have some patterns, you know, on busier streets with more multifamily and smaller streets with more single family, but there's hardly a neighborhood in, in fact, there's no neighborhood in this community that doesn't have a mix of those things. So you're going to get to see that, and we'll go through a couple spots, and then when we get to the point where we're going to end, uh, like Jennifer said, there's sort of a lot of different uses right there at that corner. And that corner is actually really fascinating because the one building is a condo building and another building is a rental building and another building is a single family building. You know, you just got it all sitting right there and they're right next to one another and it works in the community. And it's what, part of what makes it such a, a wonderful and successful community. So, all right, we'll go out. Uh, I'll meet you guys all at the front, I guess, at the front door and we'll just make our way down the way. We get to go past Unity Temple as well so you can model that. <laughs>